really important initiative. And it's a really exciting time to be getting this conference off the ground. That is something that me and, and my two co-presenters have a lot of familiarity and experience with. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and take just a few moments to do some introductions. So we'll start with myself. I'm David Nays. I am the Vice President for Academic Services and Chief Academic Officer at Highland Community College. And there are two Highland Community Colleges out there. One is in Kansas. We are the one in Illinois, uh, in Northwest Illinois, about 150 miles west of Chicago. And I'll let Sarah and Lisa introduce themselves in just a moment, but where Lisa and Sarah and I have crossed paths over the last probably five or six years is our work as uh, first members of or founding members of the Illinois Alliance of Concurrent Enrollment Partnerships state organization. Um, that was something that started with the, you know, out of the National Alliance of Concurrent Enrollment Partnerships, and I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with NACEP. I know that's they're participating in this uh, uh, in, in various ways with this particular uh, conference as well. So they're represented here as well. Uh, but that's where our cross paths. We all work in Illinois, and we've done a lot of work with the Illinois Alliance of Concurrent Enrollment Partnerships, or ILICEP. You're going to hear me talk about that in my portion of the presentation. And I'm going to go ahead and take this time to turn it over to uh, Sarah. Thanks, David. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Sarah Stashkew, and I am the current president of ILICEP, and I am also the director for P20 Educational Partnerships at the College of Lake County, which is a community college in the northern suburbs of Chicago. And I'll turn it over to Lisa. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Lisa Hagley. I am the president-elect of ILICEP, and I am the manager of the dual credit and dual enrollment program at the College of DuPage, um, which is also near uh, Chicago as well. All right. Thank you both. So, um, Lisa, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. So, uh, in this particular case, so I should say where we are with this initiative, I want to give you just a little bit of background on ILICEP. Um, so Illinois Alliance of Concurrent Enrollment Partnerships, ILICEP, as I mentioned, started out as a state chapter uh, for Illinois um, from NACEP. And so one of the things that we have been involved with for a number of years since our inception in 2014 is we've done a lot of collaboration with the College and High School Alliance, as well as the National Organization of NACEP. And so based on that, several years ago, the College and High School Alliance and Level Up uh, in 2019 published a report called Unlocking Potential. And a lot of you may be familiar with this particular report, but the report itself has policy recommendations to, as it states, close equity gaps and promote quality, which is certainly a big focus of this conference this weekend or this week. So the recommendations from Unlocking Potential are divided into six components, okay? One is equity goals and public reporting. The second one is program integrity and credit transfer. The third one is finance. The fourth is course access and availability. The fifth one is instructor capacity. And finally, the sixth one is navigational supports. Now, ILICEP, we were fortunate enough to have NACEP and the College and High School Alliance come to us. Um, we were one of two states that were offered the opportunity to, con to participate in this particular grant project. And it was offered and, and we jumped on the chance and we were really, really excited. And I can tell you that in the state of Illinois, we are very fortunate that we are, you know, a state that has been very forward thinking for the last probably decade plus when it comes to dual credit, as we call it in our state or dual enrollment, depending on what aspect of, of dual credit you're working with. Um, but we um, have had legislation, which we'll talk about here in just a little bit, a little bit later in the presentation as well. But we've had legislation in the state of Illinois that focuses specifically on dual credit and dual enrollment requirements uh, going back to January 1st of 2010 with the Dual Credit Quality Act. And it has since in recent years been amended and had a few additional pieces of legislation added onto it. So while we have been very forward thinking and, and very fortunate to be forward thinking when it comes to dual credit and all the different aspects across all of Illinois, at the same time, that also comes with some challenges. So the legislation is great to be out there when a lot of states don't even have legislation related to dual credit, but that also means that there are different you know, challenges when it comes to different stakeholder groups. 
you know, our high school and K-12 partners might see dual credit a little bit differently than the community college um, stakeholders. And the community college stakeholders are going to see it a little bit differently, most likely, than the four-year college university stakeholders. And about 90% of all dual credit offered throughout the entire state of Illinois is through our community colleges. And we have 48 community colleges across the state. All 48 community colleges um, are part of 39 different community college districts. And we are all different in terms of being our own um, local units of government. So we are not part of a larger community college system as it were, but about 90% of dual credit is offered through the community colleges. So when we were offered this opportunity as a state organization, um, we were offered the opportunity to conduct a gap analysis. That's really what this report that we're gonna be talking about today um, is about. It's about conducting a gap analysis of where Illinois stands for each component of the Unlocking Potential Report and to make state-specific recommendations aligned to the policy recommendations in the Unlocking Potential Report. So what we did as a group, as a state organization, is we gathered a diverse group of stakeholders for two virtual meetings. And those two virtual meetings initially were to basically solicit input for the Illinois Dual Credit Report. And that was published late last year. Actually, it was uh, about a year ago, September of 2020, when we were very excited to finally be able to release that particular report. So in the next few minutes, I'm going to briefly discuss some of the key findings and the recommendations from the report. So next slide, Lisa. All right. So just to kind of give you some context for where we were in terms of uh, the different stakeholders, as you can see, there's a number of key stakeholders here and they vary is across the entire state. We knew that that was gonna be absolutely essential. So we had the Illinois Alliance of Concurrent Enrollment Partnerships. That's what Lisa, Sarah, and I represent. Um, so in, in that particular case, that's an organizational collaboration for all Illinois dual credit stakeholders. So when we were founded back in 2014 as a state organization, basically the impetus for ILICEP came out of the, the notion that or what a lot of our experiences were, depending on where you worked at the state level. So if you were part of the Illinois Board of Higher Education, if you were the four-year college and universities a group, or the Illinois Community College um, group, or the Illinois State Board of Education for K-12, primarily secondary um, partnerships or stakeholders, I should say. You know, we saw so many different practitioners, the boots on the ground, so to speak. We had the dual credit teachers in the high school. We had the high school counselors, the principals, the superintendents, the regional superintendents. We have, you know, the Illinois Community College Board, the Illinois Board of Higher Education, you know, and then, you know, working together. But at the same time, oftentimes we found in our experiences that the left hand didn't always know what the right hand was doing. So if ISBE, if the Illinois State Board of Higher Education was focusing on dual credit needs, and requirements and recommendations and challenges at the high school level, was that always being communicated with the community colleges and vice versa. If the community colleges were working on legislation or needs and, and implementation challenges at their level, was that something that the Illinois Board of Higher Education stakeholders, all the different four-year college universities, how familiar were they with you know, what we were doing at the community college level? So in other words, you know, there's all these different things going on with dual credit, which was great, but oftentimes we didn't necessarily know who was doing what. And so it kind of created some sense. I wouldn't necessarily say chaos, but it just didn't offer necessarily an opportunity for us to really know and collaborate with what we were doing. And so that's where ILICEP was created, was to create a space and a platform where everyone across the state, when it came to dual credit and dual enrollment initiatives, could come together. And that's where the Dual Credit Quality Act of 2010 came into play. And in most recent years, the Model Partnership Agreement, which we'll be talking about just a little bit later. So Lisa, next slide, please. All right, so with Report Logistics, um, what we did is we convened state and local college um, and high school, state and local college and high school stakeholders from across the state in Illinois and beyond. And we did that in the spring of 2020. Now imagine, as you can kind of see on that last bullet there, um, our participation initially was impacted as a result of the, of the challenges of COVID. So we, we were approached um, you know, to participate in this grant prior to 2020, so pre-COVID. Um, and fortunately, we were able to pull it off. It was just a matter of some of our participation was limited or that we were delayed essentially in getting the report out. 
but we were still able to move along smoothly and we still had key stakeholders involved. So every effort was made to ensure the stakeholder group was inclusive, state agencies, institutions themselves, different organizations, not necessarily the colleges, the universities themselves, but focusing uh, primarily on advancing equity and access to educational opportunities, particularly through dual credit and dual enrollment. All right, Lisa, next slide, please. All right, so again, when it came to stakeholders, um, Illinois Community College Board, Illinois Board of Higher Education, Illinois State Board of Ed, Midwestern Higher Education Compact, Partnership for College Completion, Education System Center at Northern Illinois University, Warren Township High School, us, ILICEP, the Sarah E. Good STEM Academy, the Center for P20 Engagement, also through uh, Northern Illinois University, and Connect Ed, the National Center for College and Career, and Stanford Children, Illinois, and Eastern Illinois University. So as you can see, we were very rich when it came to collaborators, stakeholders being involved in this entire process, which was key. And we could even say that while this list isn't necessarily definitive or exhaustive for all stakeholders in Illinois, we're very happy and, and proud to be able to say that we had such high level participation from so many different really key primary stakeholders at all different levels across the state. And with that, I will then transition over to Lisa. All right. Thank you, Dave, um, for setting up that context. And so, as Dave mentioned, um, the ILICEP Illinois Dual Credit Report is aligned to the National Unlocking Potential Report. Um, and there are six categories where a gap analysis was done to see where Illinois falls in those areas, as well as recommendations um, that could be taken into account to close some of those gaps. So um, in the remaining part of the presentation, Sarah and I will um, go through each of those categories and highlight the strengths as well as those opportunities for um, closing some of those gaps. So the first category um, in the report is the equity goal and public reporting. And so in the Unlocking Potential report, um, the recommendation is that states set an equitable statewide public goal for increasing the participation and success of traditionally underserved student groups in college and high school programs with clear disaggregated public reporting and accountability for progress toward the goal. Um, so for Illinois, some of the strengths in the area that um, were identified in that gap analysis were that there are already equity goals that are explicitly stated in the Perkins Five State Plan. Um, there's also equity goals that are implied in the Dual Credit Quality Act um, in the introduction part of the act um, where it lists the purpose of the act. Um, and there's also disaggregated data that is reported through the Illinois State Board of Education and the Illinois Community College Board. Some opportunities, of course, for um, some of the equity uh, goal in public reporting is to add a sub goal, which includes equity to the 60 by 25 plan. And what the 60 by 25 plan is, is it's actually the statewide objective for 60% of adults obtaining um, to obtain a post-secondary certificate, degree, or industry recognized credential by 2025. Um, and this was actually a goal that was set by the Illinois P20 Council. Um, and that is a council that was established by legislature in 2009 um, to foster collaboration among the many different groups. Um, and the purpose is just to align all of the education systems from preschool, hence the P, um, all the way to education after college, um, which is represented by the 20. Um, another opportunity um, is also to add the income status to the disaggregated data that is reported by ICCB. So currently that is not um, one of the um, topics that is covered in there. Some additional notable legislative items um, that are not mentioned in the report, but that we do have legislation around in Illinois, um, is that schools cannot limit the enrollment in dual credit for students. Um, another legislative item is that high schools are actually required to notify all of their juniors and seniors of available dual credit at their high schools. Right. 
So the next category is the program integrity and credit transfer. So in the Unlocking Potential, um, the recommendation is that states support and promote high quality college and high school programs through effective oversight and cross-sector collaboration between K-12 and post-secondary sectors, as well as ensuring credit articulation. Okay, all right. And in the report, it was found that um, the strengths in the state of Illinois is already um, that we have um, the um, measures in place that already outline um, the expectations for effective oversight and um, cross-sector collaboration. Um, and that's reflected in the Dual Credit Quality Act, as well as the Illinois Community College Board um, and the Illinois Board of Higher Education Regulations, um, as well as the Model Partnership Agreement. So the Model Partnership Agreement, um, also referred to as just the MPA, um, is basically a model of recommended practice um, that came out of the Dual Credit Quality Act. Um, and that is just something that's available for the partnerships, partnerships to look into um, as you know, they want to implement it in part or in whole um, to ensure access to quality dual credit courses for all of the students. Another strength that we have in the state um, is the Illinois Articulation Initiative um, and the regulations that are referenced in point number one um, to ensure credit articulation. Um, so the Illinois Articulation Initiative, um, also known as IAI, is a statewide transfer agreement um, and that's transferable among more than 100 participating colleges and universities in Illinois. Um, and it basically outlines how courses transfer as well as the requirements for um, transferability. Um, and additional opportunities for addressing um, some of the gaps is really to ensure intentional dual credit offerings um, and to um, ensure pathway alignment between um, the dual credit and the regular and the rest of the college and the rest of the high school opportunities that students have. Um, and also to build awareness through training and marketing, um, increase communication, enhance communication for the model partnership agreement, as well as the Illinois articulation initiative. The third category is finance and um, in the national report, the recommendation is that states design funding mechanisms that remove financial barriers for low income and moderate income students to participate and excel in college level work in high school. Okay. As found in the um, Illinois uh, dual credit report um, from ILICEP is that again, the Dual Credit Quality Act um, requires partnerships to define costs and the model partnership agreement um, provide a recommended structure to, for doing so. Um, so some of those are some of the strengths um, that we already have in place um, in the state of Illinois. However, there is still um, you know, some gaps and opportunity um, for improvement. And some of the recommendations are to develop state level frameworks and parameters related to the cost of dual credit coursework. Um, also requiring partnerships to report the cost of their dual credit courses. Um, and finally, exploring strategies for reducing costs for school districts and students, um, and especially for those low income students um, and the CTE or career and technical education courses um, that students take for dual credit. All right, and now I'll turn it over to Sarah, who will present on the remaining categories. Well, thank you, David, for setting the context and Lisa for covering the first three categories. I'll cover the last three, um, starting with course access and availability. And as you can see, Unlocking Potential recommended that states ensure students are able to access college and high school courses, regardless of geography, with pathways that maximize opportunities for students to earn multiple credits and facilitate students exploring academic and career areas of interest while ensuring that those courses count toward high school graduation requirements. 
So in terms of the, um, the strengths that the report found during the gap analysis were the legislation that Lisa mentioned earlier, which requires school boards to notify 11th and 12th graders of dual credit and dual enrollment opportunities. While this was definitely a strength that we found, um, there was also a recommendation tied to this, which is that the recommendation could actually be pushed a little bit earlier, perhaps as early as middle school, so that students and families can start preparing um, to be ready for those opportunities when they become available in high school. Another strength was that the Dual Credit Quality Act does require multiple measures for placement into a dual credit, um, into a dual credit program. And the recommendation tied to this is that um, partnerships could actually demonstrate and confirm that this is really happening. So while the Dual Credit Quality Act requires it, there isn't really any reporting around this so that it's clear that each individual partnership is actually implementing multiple measures for program eligibility. And another recommendation tied to this is to make sure that the multiple measures for eligibility are communicated to students, parents, and high school staff so everyone is aware of what it takes to get into a dual credit or dual enrollment program. Now, a lot of the other recommendations, and there were quite a few recommendations in this category, um, but a lot of them center around either awareness or leveraging existing tools across the state. So for awareness, there with our stakeholders, there seemed to be um, a sense that there's a lot of confusion about the differences between dual credit and AP and the ability to articulate those differences and the benefits of each to parents and families. So one of the recommendation was really to clarify the differences so that it's easier to communicate that. And so parents and students and guidance counselors have the information they need to make really informed decisions. Another recommendation around awareness is to require school districts to clearly identify dual credit courses and curriculum guides and other materials that students, parents, and counselors are using as students are determining which courses to enroll in so that it's very clear which courses do have an opportunity to earn high school credit as well as dual credit or as well as college credit. Um, for existing tools, we have additional legislation in Illinois called the Post-Secondary and Workforce Readiness Act. And through this act, they created what they call college and career pathway endorsements. And these are things that high schools can offer to students with the appropriate approvals. For students to earn the endorsements, they need to create and complete individual plans that include both coursework and career exploration activities. And one piece of this is that I believe it's starting next year, students will also be required to earn college credit, um, early college credit in order to earn an endorsement. And while early college credit is not exclusive to dual credit, it does include AP and um, IB courses, the recommendation in this report is to really seize this opportunity to talk about dual credit and try to expand dual credit offerings. Um, another kind of way to leverage existing tools is really to use existing pathways in specific academic disciplines or career and technical education fields and encourage schools to sort of by default or automatically enroll students in the next most rigorous course in that pathway so that there is an automatic path for students that builds on their current learning and exposes them to rigorous coursework as they progress through that pathway. Another way to leverage existing tools is to really take a closer look at online delivery options. While the pandemic did impact um, some participation in our stakeholder group 
for this project, um, there are a lot of benefits or things that we can learn. And I think one of those is really, we have all had to pivot very quickly to being able to deliver instruction online. And especially for rural and small school districts, this may be a great opportunity to expand dual credit offerings and to remove some of the barriers that districts may have in being able to offer dual credit to their students. So I'm ready for the next slide. Thank you. Um, so the next area is instructor capacity and unlocking potential recommends that states develop strategies to recruit, support and diversify the pool of instructors with the qualifications to teach college and high school while encouraging collaboration between K-12 and post-secondary partners as college and high school programs are scaled. So next slide. You can see the um, strengths are our instructor qualifications in Illinois are tied to a lot of the legislation and regulations that have been discussed previously. So to the higher learning commission requirements, um, the dual credit quality act, the model partnership agreement, and then the administrative rules through the Illinois board of higher education and the Illinois community college board. Um, legislation has also designed dual credit endorsements for high school teachers. And what this means is if a high school teacher has demonstrated that they have the required credentials to teach in specific transfer dual um, transfer disciplines, they can actually work through their regional office of education and their community college to have an actual dual credit endorsement listed on their professional educators license so that wherever they go in the state, it's clear that they have the credentials and have been screened for their ability to teach dual credit. There's also um, expanding interest in and development of lists of graduate programs that um, would allow high school teachers to take graduate coursework um, in the discipline to be able to teach dual credit. So that's sort of ever evolving. Um, the Illinois Higher Board of Education does have a list which they update and there are other groups working on expanding this as well. This area is another area where there were a lot of opportunities and recommendations in the Illinois dual credit report. And I think um, this probably resonates with a lot of people as instructor capacity and qualifications can sometimes be really challenging in trying to develop and expand partnerships. So um, one of the recommendations is really to have the state find ways to help veteran teachers who maybe toward the end of their career um, earn the credentials to teach dual credit and provide financial incentives around that. There are other recommendations about building discipline specific coursework into teacher preparation programs so that as teachers are earning their um, professional educators licenses, they're also accumulating those discipline specific graduate course um, graduate credits that will enable them to teach dual credit. There were also recommendations around hiring decisions. So for HR departments at high schools to really take a look at that discipline specific coursework as they're making hiring decisions for teachers and knowing at the outset sort of whether they're likely to be able to teach dual credit or not and to really place a priority on that. And then also for school districts to continue to consider building dual credit eligibility into their collective bargaining agreements or uh, building specific tuition reimbursement for graduate coursework that's discipline specific into their uh, tuition reimbursement policies through their collective bargaining agreements. There was also a recommendation at the state level to really evaluate where we have existing dual credit teacher shortages in which disciplines and which areas, and then develop really concrete plans to close those gaps in terms of offering cohort-based models, providing funding, things like that, but really putting together a very specific action plan to put teachers on a pathway to earning the graduate credit hours required and closing those gaps. 
I did want to mention a couple other things related to instructor capacity. So um, first, the report, and I did copy a link into the chat if you're able to get to that. The report, the, the online version of the report has a bunch of active links to take you to a ton of the information that we're talking about today. But the report did provide examples in both Indiana and Minnesota of programs that are in place um, and really including some strong funding to increase the number of high school teachers who have the credentials to teach dual credit. So it was recommended that Illinois take a look at those examples and consider implementing pieces of them in Illinois as they make sense. And then one other thing to note that um, is actually really unique to Illinois, when the amendments to the Dual Credit Quality Act passed a few years ago, they did include uh, what we call a professional development plan for high school teachers. And the professional development plan is a time limited opportunity. So there were, um, teachers have four years from the time the amendments were enacted to get on a professional development plan. In order to get on a professional development plan, the teachers have to be part way toward meeting the credentials to teach dual credit. So they have to have a master's degree in some field and at least nine graduate credit hours in the discipline, or they have to be enrolled in a discipline specific master's program and have at least 18 graduate credit hours in the discipline. If they meet one of those two requirements, they can actually start teaching dual credit while they are earning the remaining credentials. And there are some reporting requirements to ensure they are working toward completion of their plan, um, but it is an opportunity to expand the number of teachers who are able to teach dual credit with a speed to launch model where we are uh, providing these opportunities for students to earn college credit while we are working toward addressing the instructor qualification barrier. Um, again, that's time limited. So I think we have until December of next year to get teachers on plans. I know there are conversations about advocacy around expanding or extending that time frame, um, but I'm not sure where that will land. And next slide, Lisa. Okay, our final category is navigational supports. And unlocking potential recommended that states prioritize the student navigational supports and advising needed to ensure student success in college and high school courses, particularly for those students historically underserved by these programs. And as you can see um, in strengths, the model partnership agreement does require partnerships to identify student supports and guidance. So there's a whole section in that model partnership agreement where um, there is some recommended language around what student supports and guidance are provided jointly through the high school and the college partner. Um, but partnerships can also sort of customize that language. Um, and then dual credit, as I mentioned earlier, is also included in the college and career pathway endorsements for high school students. And that is a really clear roadmap with an individualized plan for a student looking at both their educational pathway and their career exploration and development. So by including dual credit in those endorsements and in those plans, it is really part of a broader kind of roadmap or navigational support for the students. In terms of opportunities, um, again, this, these recommendations really focused on providing support and building awareness. And a lot of these recommendations, honestly, were really at the state level and recommending that the state agencies um, really work together to provide systematic tools and resources that can be used across the state. And they recommended tools and resources so that um, it's easier to relay information to teachers, counselors, advisors, students and parents about dual credit generally um, in terms of availability, eligibility, benefits, um, almost kind of a, a marketing and recruitment tool. Another recommendation was 
increasing the implementation of college and career pathways and providing career exploration tools related to the pathways. And in the report, again, for this section, um, there were two states that were mentioned as states that have done some work around dual credit and building dual credit into pathways for students. Those states are North Carolina and Ohio. Um, and then in terms of providing career exploration tools related to the pathways, a few different tools were mentioned in the report. Um, they are U-Science, Learning Blade, and Nevada's STEM Career Matchmaker Program. And then um, the final recommendation in this area is to build scaffolding and support for students as they engage with their dual credit coursework. So that wraps up really our um, overview of the dual credit report. Again, I put a link um, in the chat and we are also happy if you wanna email any one of us, um, we can send you out a hard copy as well if you're interested. Though again, the electronic version is really nice because it does have links to pretty much everything we've mentioned. And we are now at the point for questions and it does look Oh, like we have a question, but David answered it. And there's about a 30 second delay. So um, if you have anything else you'd like to introduce, uh, participants feel free to continue to drop those questions in the chats and I'll pass those over to our speakers. So while we're waiting for questions to come in, I'll just say, um, you know, as David mentioned, LSF was incredibly excited to be approached about this opportunity. Um, I think just having the, the forum to really gather stakeholders around the state to talk about dual credit and to understand what different stakeholders know, what their priorities are, where they see gaps um, and what they would like to see was really, um, was really helpful for us. And we are working on taking what we learned from the report. And a lot of the recommendations, as you heard, are really at the partnership or at the state level. But ILISEP is working with a number of other partners, some of them that we got connected to because of this report, to align all the work we're doing to recommendations in these six areas and to try to move things forward um, as much as we can at our level and through engaging the appropriate stakeholders and partners. And I'll just piggyback on, on that as well, Sarah. And so one of the things that we found was that when any of, when uh, a few of the, when one of the amendments, I should say, to the Dual Credit Quality Act came out a couple years ago, um, in particular, it was legislation mandated legislation that would have taken the instructor credentials for dual credit and it would have lowered them to the point where Illinois is a higher learning commission state. So we're one of the 19 states in that regional accreditation um, well, region. And so um, we were going to find ourselves in violation of the HLC teaching requirements. So that means that we were going to have to make a choice, for example, between either violating state law or violating our accreditation requirements um, as institutions across the state of Illinois. And one of the things that was particularly valuable was being able to provide input and have different discussions with the Illinois Community College Board and Illinois Board of Higher Education and Illinois State Board of Education as well to make sure that everyone understood exactly what kind of conundrum that created or quandary that really created. And that's ultimately where the model partnership agreement you know, really started to uh, come into play to making sure that we were able to address those concerns regarding that new legislation. And as a result, it allowed us to be able to find a way to be able to address those concerns, um, I think adequately, at least statewide. So the impact of having that collaboration across all the different levels of the state was, uh, was really, really important. And I think this state report is really kind of an amalgam of exactly what those recommendations are designed to do is to making sure that those um, that those opportunities and the recommendations specifically are being hit, heard, shared, and implemented at all different levels. And I, I, so it's not necessarily just, hey, these are our recommendations, let's hope that they listen. 
we do have evidence that they have been listened to uh, to some degree and, and things have started to shift a little bit. We still haven't received any additional questions in the chat. Um, so, and we have about 10 more minutes. So if there's anything else, final thoughts, takeaways for the group. Lisa, if you can just advance to the next slide. We have our contact information on here. So um, I, I think I speak for all of us, but certainly for myself, we are happy to take follow-up questions um, after this session at any time. If you'd like a hard copy of the report, we're happy to send those out as well. Just let us know how many you'd like and where we should send them and we'll get those out to you. Um, but, but again, this was a really impactful study for us. Uh, you know, part of the opportunity through the College and High School Alliance and NASAP included funding. And so that of course was helpful. <laughs> However, when we had to pivot due to COVID, a lot of the things we thought we'd spend the money on, we really didn't need money for. We didn't need money to pay for travel or lodging or meals for in-person convenings. And so, um, you know, with, with the pandemic and everyone transitioning into Zoom and other online formats, we saved a ton of money. And I feel like it would definitely be feasible for other states or organizations or collaborations to engage in a similar study without any significant funding. And um, I'm certainly, and again, I think I speak for all of us, happy to support that work if anyone is interested in undertaking a similar project. So at this time, we don't see anything, uh, any, no other responses yet, uh, but thank you all for this great presentation. And again, we see your contact information there. Uh, again, we have about five more minutes. So any final thoughts or uh, takeaways? If not, we'll just go ahead and wrap up.